Hi everybody, this is Dave with the John 17 Project here. So, I didn't get to posting this video earlier, so I'm getting to it now. Uh, life's been a little crazy. I'm in a different location because I'm out and about uh, visiting people today. So, I'm not in my usual spot for recording, so sorry about all the bright sunlight. Uh, hopefully it just doesn't wash out things too much. But, anyway, this is your first time here. Uh, welcome. This channel is all about unity in Christ, biblical unity, um, holy unity, and true unity in Christ for the body of believers. My name is David, and uh, this whole uh, channel is all about um, us coming together in unity in truth. So... I've been doing this series uh, about some of the, the divisions, old and new, um, and talking about those, especially looking at some of the older ones. So if you hear a lawnmower in the background, it's because they're mowing some grass in the park today. Um, so I will speak up. But if you're new here, just, you know, chill out. Love to, uh, if you like it, you know, hit the like button, subscribe. Comment below for those who are subscribed. Uh, definitely uh, like and like hit the notification bell and please comment below. So today I wanted to talk about a classic um, division, and I'm not going to go too deep into it. I try not to keep the, not to make these videos too long, usually between 20 and 30 minutes. This one we could get into and spend days on, honestly. I'll have links below for more information, linking to other information and other videos that really do a good job of explaining more. But um, the Great Schism is one that all of us in the body are aware of. Whether you're like me and grew up Protestant, whether you're Catholic or Orthodox, um, you are familiar with this. At least to some extent or have heard of it. So... The standard narrative is that in 1054, the East and West Church is split into what is the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. More to it than that, obviously. But as I looked further into this to refresh my memory, because it's been a while since I'd really like looked into all the details about it, it struck me as the same thing I remember thinking the first time I read about it. And it's like... Uh, this could have been avoided, but, and it's sad that it, that just now in the 20th century and here in the 21st century that the Catholics and my Catholic brothers and sisters and my Orthodox brothers and sisters are, are coming a little bit back together in some ways. Um, it really saddens my heart because they're because division is a large part of the reason why I don't think, I think that there's a lot of problems in the church and in the body of Christ because of these divisions and the roots of them. So the root of this, the, this major division really has a lot to do with a couple things. One culture uh, another language, since the East and West really did things in different languages, and politics. And the language and culture, those are somewhat understandable that it's hard to communicate fully um, about important things when there's different language, different culture, because very often we as human beings have a tendency not to take the time to try to understand somebody else's perspective and culture. Um, and this is true throughout the world. This is not an American problem, a Western problem, an Eastern problem. This is just a human problem that a lot of people just don't get each other because they don't take the time to try to understand. So it's not new of a, of a problem, but it leads to some sinful behavior. Scripture is abundantly clear that we are to deal with each other in hum love and humility and bear with one another in love. 
Well, the unfortunate thing is, is I think that that was lacking when you really read about this. And that's where the politics comes in. So if you go back to the Council of Nicaea, which is before all this split, you really got into a the church and the state coming together. This is a problem. Constantine uh, really used the church to gain more power. I mean, that's just the honest truth of the matter. You can debate whether he was really a believer or not, but what he said about the Council of Nicaea leads me to question that. Um, I'm not the judge of Constantine. Our Lord is. Our, you know, that's that's the, the Heavenly Father's um, call, <laughs> not mine. But it definitely, what he said about the council and some of the actions that the council took really lead me to um, wonder about it and question it. Um, some of those actions include uh, no longer observing Passover as the time of the Lord's resurrection, which it was. And instead, um, sort of baptizing a pagan festival of Easter, which is a fertility festival. And that goes all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and the goddess Ishtar, if you start studying the origins of Easter. Um, they also changed uh, the day of worship from Sabbath which Sabbath has always been the same, to Sunday. Now, some will argue that, you know, that's changed. Nowhere in Scripture did the Sabbath ever change. That's not scriptural at all. It was changed by men. They called that the new Sabbath for a long time. Now, these actions, you, you have to kind of scratch your head at. Because... If you look at the apostles, they taught Jewish traditions. They taught the traditions of the Old Testament. That was the scriptures they had to teach and the traditions that they did teach. And there's plenty of evidence, which I, in scripture of this, um, Paul specifically talks about um, observing Passover and talks about the Gentile believers being grafted into Israel. So... In Romans, specifically. But throughout the New Testament um, writings, the, the in the Gospel, Jesus makes it clear that the Old Testament is, is absolutely valid. He taught the Old Testament, and so did the apostles, and they wrote about it. So, when you have that legacy, that teaching, those traditions being handed down, and then there's a departure from them, that's an issue. Because the departure from them was at a time when the Romans, excuse me, the Roman Empire is persecuting the Jewish people. And that begs some serious questions. So if there's persecution going on, and Constantine himself said uh, that they did the things they did to separate themselves from, quote, the despicable Jews. There's some real problems there with the Council of Nicaea. Now, I see this, this division between the Gentile and Jewish believers is very important because if, we're, if, the, if the body of Christ started separating itself and build, the wall started being built back up, the Lord um, brought down that separated his chosen people from Gentiles and brought us together in his body and his sacrifice. And then that wall is being built back up and the division is being pushed. There's, there's problems there. And this kind of division and you mix in the power of the government. It's a lot of dark stuff that follows. And we all had no history of 
popes and bishops and leaders in the body of believers who did horrible things with political power. I mean, it's not a secret. Um, and that's so. This is, I think, kind of at the crux of a lot of a lot of the political stuff is that the seeking of political power. Kind of in studying this and reading through it and watching some videos and different perspectives, both from the Catholic point of view and the Orthodox point of view, and just listening to the history of it um, and reading about it. Politics comes up again and again in everybody's conversation that there were power struggles and there were issues of, of doctrine. But the issues of doctrine were mostly just misunderstandings of language and culture. They weren't actual disagreements in doctrine for the most, for the most part. Not on the essentials in any case. But the politics of where the seat of power was. Was it Constantinople or was it Rome? This is, a, this is an issue that was first seated in the body of Christ back at, for, during at Constantine. And there was division then and there's division later with politics involved. Now I'm not saying it was just politics Obviously, I already said there was language and culture that, that added to all that. But I'm, but that's definitely a contributing factor and a huge one if you really start reading the history of this and start um, listening to a lot of the different, different uh, uh, perspectives on the history from both Catholic and Orthodox perspectives. <laughs> Most of the scholars I've, I've read or listened to have flat out admitted that there were polit political and power struggle stuff involved in this. So, you know, that's just important to note that there seems to be a trend of political power being tied to the church or the church tying itself to political power, gaining political power, the, tie, the, the coming together of church and state and then division. There's a problem there. And when you look at subsequent divisions after this, from further on, um, politics does get involved in some of those things as well. The Church of England splitting off from the Catholic Church is a good example. With political. There's a lot of power of the king involved in that. Um, and so we know that that had that kind of connotation to it as well. So... It saddens me because, one, there was already some problems leading into this that were going on for hundreds of years before that just kind of culminated in 1054 and the official excommunicating of one another. And politics being involved in that and to a large degree, as well as the cultural and language part. And then the fact that honestly it the it violates the word of god it's sinful and i know that what i'm saying here might ruffle some feathers on both orthodox and my catholic brothers and sisters and that is not my intention but the reality of the word of god is is that god abhors the division among his people he hates it when he brings the Gentiles into the nation of Israel through the Messiah, through Jesus, blood and redemption that brings the Gentiles in to the nation. We're grafted in, as Paul as Paul writes about in Romans 11. And then that starts getting divided later on. To the point of being kind of officially and institutionally divided, it's Council of Nicaea, the first council. Politics was involved and power was involved there. And then further down you get the division of East and West, politics be and power being involved there, and so on and so forth. And this seems to be a problem that we keep coming back to. 
and not learning, not looking at what the Word of God says and letting that be our only guide into how we're supposed to operate with one another. Because it's really spelled out quite clearly. There's a lot of people who will put this church father or that church father or this saint or that saint or this theologian, that theologian, their opinions in the mix of this. But quite frankly, it doesn't matter what any of them have to say. It matters what God's word says on this. And that's just abundantly clear. That division is not godly. It is sinful. That the power can be very corrupting. You know, we, we all know the old saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, we've all seen examples of this in the church, out of the side of the church. I mean, look at what led to the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation. There was a lot of corruption going on in the, bo- in the body and in the, in the, uh, in the Western church. There was a lot of, a lot of corruption going on. I mean, we all know that that's the case. We all know that the that our Catholic brothers and sisters responded with the Council of Trent to the corruption. So, and there was politics, political power involved in all of that as well, by the way. Um, if we really start getting into it. Today, we have... Now, in the United States, in the West, and I'm sure it's true, I know it's true in like the UK and Canada and much of Europe, we now have critical race theory and cultural Marxism and social justice, which are all political things that are infecting the body of Christ with lies. And there's divisions happening. The Southern Baptist Convention the largest evangelical denomination in the world just voted in a new uh, new leader who embraces these worldviews and falsehoods. They're antithetical to the word of God. And it's political because there's political pressure. There's wanting and there and there's a problem with wanting to be accepted by the powers that be in the world in the world not a desire to stick to the word of god and let that shape your worldview and stick to what the lord says and instead it seems to be and i think this is accurate a desire to be accepted by the world And part of me wonders if that was some of the thinking that led to politics in a lot of, a lot of, uh, the churches, the East and West, was it, was it just about power? Was it about being accepted and protected from persecution? Was it saw it as a way to gain power and try to spread throughout the, the empire or kingdoms it's just a question that I've had rattling around in my head since I've been revisiting some of this material is that if politics is playing such a role sorry technical difficulty there for a second I'm back um so if, as I was saying if if politics are being allowed to play such a huge role in in some of the decisions that have been made um, and big ones, quite frankly, and have led to so much division in the body, both at the, you know, the Great Schism, the Reformation, Council of Nicaea, Church of England. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, Even today, then, then we probably need to re-examine where that is in our lives. Are we allowing these things to become idolatrous? Are we beholding 
are we allowing the the allure of power and influence to keep us from doing what we're called to do when it comes to unity. You know, I love my Catholic and Orthodox brothers and sisters. And I've expressed many times on this channel that my desire is for all of us to be joined on truth and holiness, not unity for the sake of unity, but unity based in scripture, based in truth. And holiness is not sacrificed for that either. We don't have to sacrifice truth, not to sacrifice holiness, but coming together on the essential things that we all believe in and know to be true and forsaking the the trap of, of divisiveness and denominational stuff. I, I just want to see us get to where we're breaking down walls and building bridges. And we're not letting new walls crop up in the meantime. And that eventually, I'd love to see it happen here on earth, but I don't know if it will happen like that until the Lord comes back, but there's just no more denominations whatsoever because, quite frankly, they're sinful. Not as a body per se, but as an idea and a concept. It's the denominational stuff is sinful. Excommunicating one another because of language and cultural differences and political power is just all kinds of wrong. That's not an example of bearing with, each, with one another love. It's an example of our sinfulness. And the fact that it's taken, you know, thousand years almost for things to get back to some communication and starting to work towards unity between the East and West. And even between Protestants and, and Catholics and Orthodox and all of us. The fact that it's taken so long is, is really sad. I think that there's a lot of reasons why that is, which I'm not going to go into right now. But, you know, looking at the Great Schism and what the rippling effects were. What the things were that were before it that led, kind of helped lead to it and the ripple effects thereafter. It just saddens me because of so much division and strife. So much harm to the gospel because of that. And I just, um, I just desire for us to come together. So, my prayer today is that that would be that we each as individual believers would choose to walk out in unity together and stop worrying about all the denominational strife and instead walk together in truth, you know, in love and in holiness. So that's just my, been my prayer. I hope that, um, my perspective is helpful. I don't mean to offend anybody, so please don't take offense. It's just some thoughts when I was preparing for this that I came, that were you know, kind of flooding in when I revisited this topic. And uh, I think it's very important to grapple with this difficult stuff. Be open to the fact, be open to the idea and the truth of the matter that so-called that the leaders in the church in the past in the body of Christ many of them did not do the things that they were supposed to be doing and it's led us to some not great places 
And we've got to choose to do what the Lord's called us to do, regardless of what those came before us have to say. It's what Scripture says. What the Lord says is what matters. So, with that, I'm going to end it today. I uh, I hope that uh, all of you have a great week. Please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell and comment below and share this video. I will talk to you again next week where I'll continue this series on divisions and go from there. This is Dave with the John 17 Project. I'll talk to you all later.